Hello, I'm reading chapter 10 of By the Book, Quests and Questions. Just after dawn the next day, Hawk deliberated, banging open the guild hall door loudly to awaken Wolfga Wolfgang. To his surprise, the guildmaster was already at work, on his feet and humming to himself. Good morning, Hawk said tentatively hearing how hoarse and tired his own voice sounded. He'd been up most of the night with an aching leg and an unquiet mind. Up until yesterday, he had never even seen a kobold. They weren't even mentioned in the How to Be a Hero. And now he had to figure out how to capture or defeat one? Was it worth it? Wolfgang was busily nailing faded yellowed notices to the previously empty quest board. Unfortunately, he was barely tall enough to reach the bottom of the board. At the sound of Hawk's voice, he turned and squinted, rusty nails protruding from his mouth. You is it, he mumbled, dislodging the nails and causing them to fall and tangle in his beard. I heard how you saved Frau Junger and her cat from the fire yesterday. Well done, boy. You'll make an adventurer yet. Hawk winced. Actually, he said, that wasn't me. That was my brother Falcon. Wolfgang smiled, picking up, picking the nails out of his beard. Oh, so it was your brother again. He, with a grunt, Wolfgang strained to reach higher on the quest board. So how is that leg of yours today? Fine. Here, let me do that, said Hawk, trying to ignore the pain as he took the papers out of Wolfgang's hands. Wolfgang offered the handful of damp nails he had pulled from his beard, but Hawk shook his head politely, ex suppressing a grimace. That's okay, I'll just use these. He picked up a few fresh ones from the neat pile on the floor. Thank you, boy. They didn't design this place with dwarves in mind. Not too many dwarves have the adventuring spirit, you know. Most of them wandered off from here when there was no wor work left in the tin mines. Used to work them myself when I was a boy. Knew the Zvergweg like a back of my hand. Hawk turned his attention from the old man's ramblings to the paper in his hand. Most of them were quite old and had obviously been nailed up and taken down at least once before. The oldest and most tattered was the offer of an unspecified cash reward for the return of the baronet Barnard von Siegborg. Most of the others were fairly boring. Missing ring, list of bounties, etc. Hawk looked over the bounty list before nailing it up. Laughers, dire wolves, foxes, ogres, trolls. Trolls? Those were real? What a fire that was yesterday, Wolfgang was saying. Everyone in town came out to help. Reminded me of old times when people still cared about things here. You should have seen us all the day Barnard went missing. Barnard? The baronet. The baron's heir. Uh, oh. Hawk hammered the bounty list onto the board with three swift strokes. C can you tell me anything about the baron's family? He asked. After all, how to be a hero said, get to know your lo local leaders. Family? Replied Wolfgang, shaking his head sadly. Ugh, there's no family left to him now. First we lost the little girl, then the baroness died. Lovely woman she was. And finally, Barnard rode off and never came back. What a tragedy, losing his heir and in his prime, too. Now poor Stefan's all alone in that big castle of his, and no one's seen hide nor hair of him in two years. Losing Barnard was the last straw, they say. Hawk sides, standing a bit back to look at his work. Seems like this place just had one bad thing after another, he observed. Wolfgang 
just nodded sadly. I tried to tell you, didn't I? He said. Everything that used to be good has gone bad. The very dead in the cemetery wake up at night and start howling. And that kobold. Actually, said Hawk eagerly, that's what I came to talk to you about. This thing's going to burn down the whole town if we don't stop it. I want to do something to help, but I don't know anything about kobolds. This isn't your garden variety, kobold, said the Wolfgang bravely. It's off its rocker. You watch out now, son. It'll take a dislike to you just because you helped Fra Jungfer. Hawk didn't bother to correct him. Do you have any idea how I might defeat it? Wolfgang just grunted. Kind of hard to defeat something you can't find. I don't know why Schultz even bothered to put up a reward for the thing. How much is the reward? It's on the paper you just nailed up. Hawk looked. Sure enough, Kobold was on the list. Ten, Hawk read out loud. Not a bad price, commented Wolfgang. Still, I can't see any way of earning it. Why, I hear it. The little creature can set you on fire with just a flick of its fingers. Ten, repeated Hawk with a touch of disappointment. That doesn't sound like much. After all, I, I got ten for the wool. He stopped, looking at the notice again. Wait a second. Ten sonen? Th those are the gold ones. Th that's like a hundred mond. Ah, good with the numbers, are you? Good to know you've had some education. Your manners, though, could use a little improvement from time to time if you could forgive me for... Hawk didn't wait to hear the rest because he was already out the door. Falcon blew on his raw, blistered hands, watching as his breath turned to chill white smoke in the dawn air. As usual this early in the morning, the stable master was nowhere to be seen. He turned and looked into the white-rimmed eyes of the black stallion that stared at him over the stall door. The stable master is probably still in bed, he said to the creature, like I should be. I got burned by the kobold yesterday, he explained, holding his hands up to show the horse, who laid back its ears. It hurts like anything, but I still need to work. We need the money. Falcon grabbed the shovel and started to pile up the befouled straw that covered the ground. He couldn't believe the state of this place, considering how hard he had worked yesterday. From the level of cleanliness the stable master expected, Falcon would have thought that he ate dinner here on the straw. Well, said he thought with a grin, if he did, at least there would be no one around to complain about his table manners. Trying to focus on the money he would earn for Hawk, Falcon shoveled, sweated, and otherwise made himself miserable for what seemed like two days. Finally, there was only one stall left to clean, the one with Falcon's least favorite horse. All the other horses were happy to be let out of their stalls to run around the paddock. The black stallion, however, was nothing but trouble. Okay, I'm going to let you out of your stall so you can go play, all right? he said to the stallion as he approached it. It just snorted. I'm going to clean out your stall, put in some nice fresh bedding, and put some oats in your food bin. I'm your friend, remember? The horse laid its ears flat and glared at Falcon, showing the red streaked eyes of it, the whites of its eyes. Now, I'm going to reach over and unlatch your stall. Gently, gently. Don't bite. Don't bite! Snap! Falcon jumped back as the horse's large teeth met loudly in midair, right where the hand had been. The horse whinnied loudly, stomping and thrashing its tail. Hey, watch it, the stable master bellowed from the barn door. Thanks for the warning, Falcon replied, turning to face his employer. That's a very valuable animal, so don't hurt it, the stable master said, folding his arms disapprovingly. Hurt him, echoed Falcon in astonishment. He nearly bit my arm off. <laughs> the stable master grinned, showing the gaps between his brownish teeth. That was the baronet's horse, he clarified. It's very spirited. Falcon flexed his chilled fingers, grateful he still had them. What's his name? Rowling. How do you get Rowling out of his stall, Falcon asked. Like this. The stable master reached over with a rake to unlatch the horse's stall door. 
Watch out, he shouted. Rowling bolted forward and Falcon ducked to the void being trampled. The stallion snorted at him, then trotted out to the paddock. Falcon shook his head as he watched the beast pass. He liked most animals, but he wasn't about making an exception. As Rowling flickered his tail at Falcon, Falcon noticed the long paralleled scars that marred the glossy black flanks. Falcon remembered that Wolfgang had said, had said, how did Rowling get hurt? He asked, pointing. The stable master scratched at his uneven chin, an uneasy expression coming over his face. Barnard went out riding one day, he said a bit tensely. Hell bent for trouble as usual. Rowling turned without him, clawed up and bleeding bad. Wouldn't let nobody near him. Nearly died, the dumb animal. So do you think Barnard was killed by a monster? The stable master grimaced. Baron, don't allow us to say that. Still has a couple of servants keeping Barnard's room all nice, just like he was just a couple of years late for supper. Falcon regarded the stable master for a moment. He had the odd feeling the man was holding something back. There's something else, isn't there? Falcon said quietly. The stable master paused in mid-scratch. Huh? Falcon considered for a moment. He didn't want to risk offending his employer, but his instincts were telling him to press further. You remember something else, he said gently. Something you didn't tell the Baron. The stable master just looked at him in astonishment, and Falcon knew instantly that his instincts had been right. Slowly, the stable master began scratching at his beard stubble again. I sort of wanted to tell him, you know, in case it meant something. Why didn't you? He'd have thought I was nuts. Well, you can tell me. It doesn't matter what I think. That's true enough, said the stable master. All right, you tell me if this makes any sense. When Barnard came to saddle up Rowling that day, I was out back tending the fence. But I heard him talking, and I looked up, and damned if he weren't talking to a rain barrel. Falcon tried not to look too puzzled. A rain barrel. Yeah, he was saying something about going somewhere to end the curse on the valley. Sounds very heroic, Falcon observed. But a rain barrel? That's just nuts. And and the really crazy thing is, I, I could almost swear I heard it talk back. What did it say? The stable master looked at Falcon as though he had sprouted horns. Well, of course it didn't say anything. I, I was just hearing things. And what did you hear? Just, just a voice? No, no words, at least... Here, the stable master began to look very uncomfortable. <laughs> Not then. Later, though? <laughs> well, that night after it got dark, I went to check on Rowling, who was doing pretty bad. I was passing by that same barrel on the way out, and I heard a voice. The same voice. What did it say? It said... The stable master looked sideways at Falcon as if trying to gauge whether or not he was being mocked. It said, Revenge. Falcon felt a strange shiver. Did you look to see if anyone was there? Are you kidding? I got the hell out of there. I avoided that barrel for weeks after that. What do you think it was? The stable master, clearly disturbed by the memory, shot Falcon a look of irritation. Who cares, anyway? Just get back to work. Falcon sighed with resignation. He was surprised that the stable master had told him even as much as he had. Entering the now empty stall, Falcon brushed off the saddle blanket that was draped over the stall barrier. The initials B.V.S. were in ornately embroidered upon the blue and violet cloth. Suddenly, he thought he understood why Rowling was so ill-tempered. He's pining for his master, Falcon observed aloud, touching the embroidery. Barnard must have been a great man to earn such loyalty. For some reason, the stable master began to laugh. You say the damnedest things, he observed. Then he walked off, still laughing. 
What's so funny? Hawkins said to the stable master's back. No response. He shrugged, then picked up his shovel and went back to work. Isn't it extraordinary? Al said, watching his sister's face as she observed her first sight of Irana's piece. It was hard not to smile. Her eyes were as round as gold coins. This is the location of the magical necklaces I told you about. Ren's cheeks flushed with excitement. Oh, it's beautiful. I've never seen so many flowers. Yes, and they appear to be magical. It's impossible to damage them. Ren experimentally stomped with one bare foot on a patch of what looked like yellow violets. They're springy. Gleefully, Wren jumped hard on a patch of pink bluebells, letting out a cry of surprise as they sent her bouncing into the air. Hey, look, I'm a rabbit, she said. Al sighed. He should have realized that Wren wouldn't appreciate the dignity of this place. All right, he said. That's enough of that. We've got business to take care of. What kind of business? Wren wrinkled her nose at the word, looking more rabbit-like than ever. See that tree over there? See if you're tall enough to reach the lowest branch by standing on those rocks. Sure, replied Wren. That's no problem. She stood up under the tree and looked up at it. Look at all those sparkles. It looks like it would light up the whole meadow at night. I imagine it does. Now stand up on that rock and try to reach the branch. Be careful. It's a bit slippery up there. I'll stand here in case you fall. Wren made a face at him. Really, at twelve, she should have attained more maturity than this. But, as usual, Al said nothing. I can climb any tree, Wren said. She scaled the rock steps and reached for the lowest branch, her fingers barely grazing the smooth bark. Okay, so maybe not this one, she amended amiably. Can't you reach it? Yeah, but I can't get a good grip. Hey, if you just want a piece of fruit, I can throw a rock and knock one down. I've always managed to get apples that way. Al winced. No, no. That might damage it. Wren thought for a moment, tapping her fingertips against her lips. I know, she said. We could do it piggyback, back the way Hawk used to do to me when I was little. Hawk's a bit stronger than I am, Al said, wincing at his own understatement. Besides, these days, you're as tall as a grown woman. But I'm really light, Wren insisted. Al pondered, but he couldn't think of another option. All right, just be quick about it. Al joined her on top of the rock. There was barely enough room for the two of them on that smooth, flat surface. Bend down, she said. Al did so, half expecting both of them to go careening into the stream. But to his surprise, Wren climbed up on his back lightly and easily, compensating the moment he started to lose his balance. She wrapped both hands around the low branch and swung herself up into it. Without Wren's stabilizing influence, Al slipped sideways. Frantically, he windmilled his arms to regain his balance, but to no avail. He fell and landed on his side among the white flowers that bloomed in the shade of the tree. The blossoms were thick and fragrant, absorbing his weight like a down mattress. What color fruit do you want me to get? came Wren's voice from above. Al sighed with relief. She must not have seen this fall, given the fact she wasn't tumbling out of the tree with laughter. Anyone will do, said Al, sitting up. Just hurry. If we're going to get back to Alpendorf, we need to get started before noon. While Wren rustled the branches overhead, Al arranged his legs more comfortably beneath him and gazed around at the meadow. It was an amazing expanse of blooms. Al let his eyes drift over the soft colors, admiring the way they blended together like intricate harmonies of a song. There was something about Arana's peace that confused the senses, made him almost believe he could see, sense, and hear colors. How marvelous it would be if he, like that legendary Arana, could reshape the world and create something miraculous that would outlast him. Just the thought made his heart beat faster, but the quick 
charge of excitement was replaced almost instantly by the dull ache of futility. It smells great up here, said Wren. Are you sure color doesn't matter? I'll bet the blue ones taste like raspberries and the yellow ones like strawberries. You're not making any sense, Al said. Just hurry. He made a mental note not to involve Wren in anything requiring haste. Jeez, replied Wren, somewhat sounding annoyed. I'm right in the middle of the most magical place in the whole world, and all you can think about is that we're late. I should think you'd be happy to be here among all this magic, since you're a magical sort of person. Al's dull ache turned into a sharp pain beneath his ribs. No, I'm not, he said quietly. Zara told me that I didn't have any magical potential. Well, then Zara must not know anything about magic. And even if she was right, you could still enjoy the magic here in the garden. I have no way of sensing it, said Al stiffly. Magic can't be tapped by those without the potential. Ha, said Wren, still hidden by the branches of the tree. You don't have to be magic to feel the nexus. I can feel the nexus. You can? Al suddenly felt as though he swallowed a large, cold rock. Yeah, it's all tingly. Was this just Wren's imagination at work, or was it something else? Al shook his head to chase away the thought. Wren was only a child, an impulsive child at that, very unlikely to be harboring any magical powers. Or was it only jealousy clouding his judgment? If Wren really did have magical talent, it would be criminal for him to let his own disappointment and envy keep her in ignorance. If you hurry, Al said, we can have Zara test you for magic when we get back. She's a fake, Wren said scornfully from the part of a tree quite far from where she'd climbed up. She said you didn't have magic. Don't you dare believe her, Al. You've always loved magic. My feelings about it are irrelevant, Al said quietly. Okay, I'm taking a blue one, Wren said at last. Watch out! With that, Wren jumped down, disappearing into the white downy blossoms below. Give me the fruit, please, said Al, rising. Wren clambered to her feet with a smile and held out the shimmering fruit. Doesn't it smell like raspberry jelly to you, she said. Hmm, said Al, noncommittedly taking the fruit from her and cradling it in his hands. It was soft to the touch like a peach and shimmered in several shades of iridescent blue. Suddenly, Wren's expression went very serious. You do so have magic, Al. Al met her eyes and, despite himself, was touched by the sincerity in them. He gave, their, gave her a tight smile. It is pleasant to believe that, isn't it? He decided against putting the fruit in his bag. It was very likely get squashed. Come along now. We, let's get back to Zara. I promised her this fruit yesterday. She, she must be impatient by now. Al waded back into the stream. With a sigh, Wren followed him. By the time they got back to town, Wren was complaining bitterly about her wet legs. Al reminded himself for the hundredth time, never ever ask Wren for help for anything again. Don't forget to call me Fox, Wren said as they approached the magic shop. Al was too tired to argue. He pushed open the door and entered, taking a moment to adjust to the dim ruddy light and the smell of incense. There was no sign of Zara, but Al addressed the empty room. Greetings, Zara. I have returned with the fruit as promised. In a low voice meant for Wren's ears only, he added, Behave! Wow, Wren said as if she hadn't heard. This place is weird. What's that thing up on the pedestal? It's not a thing. That's Zara's familiar. <laughs> it doesn't look very familiar to me. Her companion, Al explained irritably. Now please, just be very still and quiet. Zara is a she and very powerful. A cloud of red smoke exploded on the dais, and the room reverberated with thunder. Zara stood before them, looking as though she'd been called for something very important. Wow, breathed Wren. Give me the fruit. 
Zara said without preamble. Al felt oddly reluctant to approach her, but he held out the fruit, bowing respectfully. As if of its own accord, the fruit leaped from Al's hands into Zara's. Ren's eyes goggled. Zara examined, examined the fruit carefully. Good, she said finally. You may go now. You said something about a reward? Al reminded her as politely as he could. Her expression quickly soured and she turned to Damiano. What could the human possibly want in exchange for such a trivial task? Gold, cried Ren. Al winced and replied quickly. Perhaps you could test my, my brother Fox here for magic, he suggested. He is very bright and would be an apt student. I rather doubt the human's assessments, said Zara to their familiar, raising an eyebrow. But it matters little to me. One more, the rune of awe. She traced the awe rune in midair with one of her long, slender fingers. The fiery image exploded into Al's consciousness with the force of a hammer. He sank to his knees for a second time in two days, bewildered, overcome by revelation. The rune didn't mean awe. In some strange, arcane way, it was awe. Not the word, but the feeling, the very core of the sensation he had felt first at Arana's peace. Only somehow it was distilled into an image that trapped its power to be harnessed directly. Words, Al suddenly realized, were a weak, shoddy form of communication. He looked up at Zara and Chalk, trembling with the power of raw, undiluted emotion. What did you do to him? said Ren in a panicky voice. Interesting, said Zara to Damiano. Humans are so unpredictable. Al tried to rise and found that he couldn't. His legs felt as though they had turned to water. What happened? he asked breathlessly. Why is the rune different this time? The rune is the same, Zara said scornfully. It is you who have changed. Ren frowned. You mean he didn't have magic before and now he does? Don't be a fool, Zara said. Magic is internal and immutable. Human experience, however, is not. One can be told the meaning of a rune, but it matters not if that person lacks the experience to understand its meaning. Huh? was Ren's eloquent response. I think I understand, Al said, as the effects of the rune began to fade. The first time I came here, I had never experienced awe, so the rune was meaningless. At Azrana's peace, though, I felt the emotion for the first time in my life. Zara just shifted her weight, looking bored. With Ren's help, Al got shakily to his feet. So, he persisted, does this mean I have magical talent? Damiano made a little growling sound, and Zara stroked underneath his chin. You see how slow the human is, she mused. I wouldn't call his paltry magical potential talent, would you? Zara's confirmation, as weak as it was, made the world disappear as Al stared into Zara's vivid green eyes. He had magic. He had been right. He had felt the power of the Nexus and he had felt it in himself as well. See, I told you, said Ren's voice from a thousand miles away. I must learn, he said, still staring at Zara. Teach me a spell. A spell, he says. Zara traced a rune into the air. It looked something like a backwards S. Al felt a powerful resonance in his body as he suddenly gleaned from that tiny symbol the entire concept of spell. Magical forces pulled from the chaotic infinity, then harnessed focused and controlled to create a single effect. Yes, said Al, his heart racing. 
I would like to study to become a great spellcaster. And I, said Zara, would like you to leave my shop. Perhaps we both can be satisfied. The spell rune vanished, and she traced another into the air. An asymmetrical series of lines radiating from a blank center. Open, she said. Al stared at the new rune and drew from it its true meaning of open. Release, emptiness, clarity, unfolding, unlocking, a passage through. Turn and look at the rune spell on the back of my door, said Zara. Al did as she asked. A strange symbol was carved into the wood. It looked for all the world like a mating of the two runes that Zara had just shown him, a sinuous curve surrounded by radiant lines. Open spell. He was already concentrating on the door when the revelation came to him. With a soft snick, the door unlatched and came open a fraction of an inch. He felt an accompanied surge within him, a faint, dizzying feeling of release. Wow, said Wren. Did you do that? Al stood frozen in rapture, unable to speak. More than just the door to the magic shop had opened. Something flowed through him now and checked like a swollen river breaking through a sheet of spring ice. He did it indeed, said Zara. And now that the door has opened, both of the humans shall leave. Al finally found his voice. Zara, he turned to ask a thousand questions, but before he could finish, he found himself standing outside in the street. He raced back to the door to find it closed. There was no handle. He knocked loudly. The strange energy that had awakened in him was still moving within him, and the feeling made beads of sweat break out on his brow. Zara, please let me in. I have more questions. There was a silence from within the magic shop. Al pounded his door hard, feeling the sharp sting of wood against his knuckles. I, I don't think she's going to let us back in, said Wren, her voice small and strange. Al turned to her and only dimly noticed that her brows were drawn together in concern. She has to, he snapped at her. I can't stop now. I have to learn more. Can't you see that? Wren's eyes widened. Can't, can't, can't you just open it the way you did from inside? Al stopped, staring at her for a moment. He felt his panic slowly dissolve, replaced by dull embarrassment. Turning back to the door, he focused on it. He tried to visualize the rune spell he had seen from the inside. It was a fairly simple design. He called in his memory to duplicate the exact placement of each of the radiant lines and the exact shape of the serpentine figure in the center. He tried to burn that in image into the door with his eyes. After a moment's concentration, he felt a small portion of the energy inside him focus and release. The door unlocked and swung open a couple of inches. Al started toward it, but Sara suddenly flung the door the rest of the way open, blocking his path. She did not look pleased. I have no time for humans, she snapped, her green eyes flashing. Perhaps the Archmage Erasmus will see fit to trifle with you. You'll find him at the top of Zauberberg, which even a fool can see from anywhere in the valley. Now be gone. Before Al could reply or question her further, she slammed the door hard. Then the door disappeared entirely, leaving only a smooth, blue plastered wall. Erasmus, Al murmured to himself, an archmage, one of the most powerful spellcasters. He'd read about archmages in stories all his life, but he'd never known that one lived so close. Suddenly, the thought of going back to Alpendorf seemed ridiculous when somewhere in this valley was a human being of incredible magical skill who could teach him things that he'd only dreamed about. Until now. Al turned to Wren distractedly. Go back to the inn, he said. I'll return there later. I have much to think about. Then we're not going back to Alpendorf today? Asked Wren with delight. Al nodded slightly and walked off, barely hearing her. 
one word filled his his head. Zauberberg.